Thanks everybody for joining us. So welcome. Uh, I am Ryan Temple, the founder here at Sustainable Northwest Wood. For, for those who don't know the, the organization, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of the nonprofit Sustainable Northwest, but uh, we are a for-profit. We're a, a wood distribution yard based here in Portland, uh, focused on selling local and sustainably harvested wood, in so doing, supporting the uh, small towns throughout the Pacific Northwest and also supporting those of us who've uh, shown a commitment to sustainable forestry, uh, whether they be family landowners, community lands, public lands, you name it, we support all those folks trying to do the right thing. Uh, in addition to selling wood, one of the things we try and do to, to support and, uh, and broaden awareness of these efforts is to host uh, meetings like this. So this is the fourth in our sustainable Wood Stories series, uh, and uh, my hat is off to you, Lynn. Thank you for all that you do to coordinate and make these things happen for us. Um, for this particular one, uh, we decided we would focus on the issue of fire. Uh, fire has, uh, has always been part of our ecosystem here in the West. Uh, in the recent uh, decade or so, maybe it seemed to be uh, increasingly prevalent and then this summer in particular, uh, the, the effects of fire seem to be especially acute. Uh, I think for those of us who live perhaps in urban areas, uh, Portland for instance, uh, the, the notion of fire sometimes seems a little bit abstract. We, we read about them in the news and we see their horrific images. Uh, th this summer we got to experience them, if not firsthand, at least secondhand, as the Willamette Valley was socked in with smoke uh, for a, a couple of weeks here. The, the intuitive response, I think, to this uh, for, for the layperson like myself is to say, oh my gosh, uh, what can we do about this? We, we can't be having this. We've got to find a way to control and manage this situation so we have fewer of these fires. And that's not necessarily an entirely untrue response but it seems that the, uh, the complexities of the situation are enough that it's perhaps worth peeling back the layers a little bit and figuring out what is really going on here. So we decided to pose a few basic questions. Uh, what is the historical role of fire in the, uh, the ecosystems of our region? Uh, what's really currently going on? Has some things changed, whether it be natural changes, uh, man-made changes, climate change, forest management, that's, that's causing fires to behave perhaps a little bit differently now than they had in the past? And if so, then, then what are some of the things that we can do? What are some of the management decisions we can make? And as a wood yard, the purchasing decisions we can make to make sure that we're finding the ways to best be in balance and in harmony with fire. Uh, in order to help us get to the bottom of some of these questions, uh, we've enlisted the expertise of two research associates from, the, from Oregon State University. Uh, we have Dr. Chris Dunn, who has spent time on the, uh, the front lines of fires, uh, as well as uh, in, the, in the research side of things. So he has first-hand experience, uh, but really trying to figure out uh, how communities and, uh, and land managers can plan their activities to make fire something that uh, can be worked with as opposed to against uh, in, their, uh, in both their management and their suppression activities. And Dr. James Johnston, uh, also at Oregon State University, has done a lot of research on the topic as well. Uh, today we're going to hear from him particularly on some of the historical records of fire so we can better put into context uh, what we've seen over the last couple years uh, within the framework of what's going on long term in our forest. Are these in fact anomalies or is this just the way our forests behave? So. With that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to these two. And, and let me just say, I guess one, one other thing, uh, we are going to be leaving time for questions at the end. So uh, if you have a question, type it into the chat section of this. Uh, I'll be monitoring that. And then uh, at the end, we'll pull those questions up and we'll have a little conversation in case uh, some of the things that you are most interested in were missed during the presentations. So let me turn it over now. James, you are up first, I do believe. I am up first. Can everyone hear me? And can everyone see the slide of fire on my screen? I have one person respond. Yes, yes, you are good. All right. 
Thank you so much, Ryan and Lynn and everyone at Sustainable Northwest Wood for hosting me and my friend and colleague, Chris Dunn. I am going to really briefly go over some of the biophysical and historical context for recent fires. And then Dr. Dunn will tell you everything you really want to know about fire in Oregon. A good part of what you need to know about fire in Oregon is simply our location on the planet Earth. There we are in the west coast of North America, about halfway between the pole and the equator. And this position is extremely important because the sun heats the surface of the Earth differentially. Warm air from the equator rises and heads towards the poles until it drops at about the mid-latitudes. Because the Earth is spinning on its axis at approximately 1,011 miles per hour east to west, those warm air is bent west straight toward us. It picks up a lot of rain from the Pacific Ocean and it dumps us, dumps it on a day like this right here in Oregon. When that rain encounters the crests of the Cascades, a lot of that moisture is released, which creates a dry interior part of our state and a wet coastal part of our state, which you can see in this map of Oregon, which is color-coded by precipitation. The iconic tree species of Western Oregon is Douglas fir, which often grows in very old, dense, closed canopy forests like you see here. These are some of the highest biomass terrestrial ecosystems on Earth. The iconic tree species of the dry interior of the state is ponderosa pine, a supremely well-adapted tree to fire drought and insect attacks. My lab, the Dendroecology Lab at Oregon State University College of Forestry is really interested in reconstructing the historical fire regime in these two different forest types to learn how often fire burned before, you know, settlement by Euro-Americans. Here is a map that shows some of our fire history reconstruction sites in Oregon. And I'll first focus on this area here, the Blue Mountains in Eastern Oregon, about six miles due east of my present location in sunny Corvallis. We use dendritic ecology techniques to reconstruct fire. It involves finding dead wood and sawing it up. It looks like this, and what you see there is a fire scar. We take that wood back to our laboratory and we use some pretty sophisticated equipment to cross date it, which means to assign to each of those tree rings an annual year. When we know what year those fire scars were formed, like this, we can calculate the mean interval between fires and we understand about how frequently fires were burning in Oregon before modern land managers began to put out fires. So what have we found? In the dry interior of our state, fire was very frequent. Here are two forest types in the Blue Mountains. The first, the Ponderosa Pine dominated stand, and second, a moist mixed conifer stand. Today, that Ponderosa Pine stand is dominated by Ponderosa Pine. Grand Fir stand is dominated by Grand Fir. But both of these sites tended to burn very frequently before the Forest Service and other land management agencies began to exclude fire from the landscape 100 years or so or more. Um, here are some historical fire frequencies in these fire types. In general, fire burned these stands at least once a decade for hundreds and hundreds of years talk a little bit about work that we have ongoing in the Western Oregon Cascades. This is the moist coastal part of the state where we'd expect fire to be less frequent historically. And it is somewhat less frequent. This photograph shows a classic old growth Douglas fir Western hemlock stand dominated by 500 plus year old Douglas fir and some Western hemlock. 
At the bottom of this graphic, you see a timeline from the year 1550, that's about 500 years ago, all the way up to the present year, present day at 2000. And those red bars indicate years in which fire burned in this stand as reconstructed from tree ring evidence. And as you can see, fire was much more frequent in the historical past. In fact, the longest fire-free gap is from now until the last fire. Here's another stand where you see a similar pattern of relatively frequent fire, even in the moistest forest types that we have in Western Oregon. So here's what Oregon has looked like in two out of the last four years. And Chris is gonna describe uh, a little bit more about contemporary fire patterns and contemporary fire management. I want to make just one more point about historical fire, which is that what is happening now has happened before. Here's an account from, from a newspaper about 120 years ago, which is describing a giant fire a great forest fire in the Cascades, consuming thousands of acres of valuable timber and making it disagreeably warm for the wild animals that infest the region. Probably explains the cause of much smoke hanging in dense volumes around the foothills. We have told that some parties who recently attempted to cross by way of the Lebanon route ran into the fire at a place known as Seven Mile Hill. Had their wagons and goods entirely consumed, barely escaping with their horses and their lives. Here's another account. The woods are ablaze for miles and a report about Superintendent Griffin running a train through the fire at about 70 miles per hour, possibly a slight exaggeration. Here's the Oregonian from August 1st, 1857. The atmosphere was so thoroughly loaded with smoke from vast fires in the coasts and cascade ranges and mountains as to create a sort of distemper among the people throughout almost the entire valley. The disease resulted from inflammation of the respiratory produced by inhalations of smoke and somewhat resembled influenza. The persons affected were troubled with labor breathing, slight cough, and mucus expectoration. This may sound familiar to us. In 1864, another giant fire in the Western Oregon Cascades. We read about Egyptian darkness, but it is smoke, Josephine's smoke, smoke in the morning at noon at night, meet a neighbor, it is smoke, parting from one, it is smoke. Hogs running around are smoked through and through live, running bacon. Again, potentially a slight exaggeration, but the point, of course, is this has happened before. Here's some of the acreages of fires that burned in the historical past. Any one of the fires that burned in the late 1800s was as large as the total acreage burned in recent fire years that we think of as historically bad. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Dunn. Um, there'll be some chances to ask me questions and have some discussion after he's done. Thanks, everybody. All right. Can everybody hear me? Couldn't find the mute button. It all changed on me. Yeah, uh, there up. you are. There you are. All right. Thank you. So, you know, uh, James had shown a lot of frequent fire in the past. And, and what we really uh, document in that is this transition um, from a, one paradigm to another. And it's a paradigm that the Native Americans had prior to European colonization here in the United States, where uh, they had a relationship with fire that was fundamentally different to us and fundamentally different than the one uh, we pursued for well over a hundred years and into today. And now uh, in part, it seems that we're looking for a new paradigm to, to uh, lead us into the future. And so you can see here's some Native Americans using fire uh, across this grassland landscape and then um, what a Forest Service actually promo photo here of their efforts uh, to suppress fire, whether it's from air or on the ground and so forth. Now this really, you know, was a, a, a debatable topic back in the early 1900s. Uh, and, and at that time, uh, the Forest Service was setting up the, you know, the, the, the Federal Forest Reserves or what are now the National Forest Lands. Um, and, and the timber industry was really pushing back against their efforts to uh, halt 
that uh, prescribed burning practices by the, the Native Americans that were uh, common across uh, much of the Western United States. And here you can see, you know, George Hoxie and others saying, you know, we need to continue this light burning across our dry forest lands to protect the more productive timberlands in the wetter forests. You know, that tra transmission of fire across from a dry to a wet forest. Uh, but the federal government pushed back and ultimately won, you know, through series of, of big meetings and, and scientific efforts to really understand this. And then they pushed back because they were really focused on uh, the need for a, a long-term sustainable timber supply, in part because there was a, a timber famine coming out of the upper Midwest, you know, as we were moving towards the West. Uh, th those regions were, were largely uh, overlogged and, and transferred into more agricultural use. And so there was this fear that we weren't going to have a long term timber supply. And so they said, you know, fire does kill trees. We know that. And so if we can halt fire's occurrence, then we can move into the future with more larger timber supply. And that seemed like a pretty reasonable um, action at the time, you know, and, and it was it was addressing a, a, a perceived risk uh, of that timber supply across the nation. Um, and it was supported by uh, the climate at the time, particularly this climate, what maybe is you could refer to as a climate anomaly, but but nonetheless, during the the mid you know, 20th century, there was a cooler period, as well as more wet period during the summers, and that really allowed for fire suppression organizations to be uh, more effective than they are today. And with that process, we built these expectations of what we can. Uh, do with our landscapes, how we can engage with our landscapes. And we're largely coming out of that into this period where we're seeing increasing temperatures with uh, a changing climate and currently a decrease in summer precipitation. And we, we see that effect uh, transpire into our fire seasons. And we see that all across the globe, not just here in the United States. So you can see these hot spots. Um, and what we're, we're seeing here in the Western United States is about a 30 day increase in fire season. So the, the length of fire season and when large fires could occur have increased by about 30 days here in the Western United States. And in, in some cases around the globe, even longer than that. And that's really that climate effect uh, overlaid on top of that management regime. So the suppression allowed for increased forest density um, and uh, expansion of our, our timber base and, and those interacting then with uh, this changing climate has resulted in the conditions we see today. And, it, and those conditions really are about more fire now, really developing more fire. And so this is, you know, in the red here is that early period. What you see across the y-axis here is um, how successful we are at capturing a fire in the initial attack phase, which is generally under an acre, uh, they keep growing that and what they call small fire or success up to 300 acres as fires continue to get bigger. But you've seen as we come out of that, what uh, is, is somewhat of a climate anomaly, we've started to decrease our ability to actually be successful at even suppressing fires at that stage. And with that slight reduction, which is still meeting about 98% success, we're seeing this huge increase in burned areas, which you see in these bar graphs. Um, and we're, we see that all across the Western United States and here, uh, of course, in Oregon as well. And with that comes increasing expenditures. We're spending billions of dollars at this point suppressing fires. Um, estimates reach about six billion. This is, this is um, so there's an underlying about $3 billion that we invest every year up front. And then this is the additional cost that, that approaches about $6 billion in just direct suppression efforts. Nothing about the post-fire effects and recovery process, um, but just the suppression efforts at this point. So huge increases in burned area and expenditures all across that. And with that, we are seeing a new or modern fire regime. So, and what I mean by this is that we're still successful at 98% successful, in fact, of suppressing fires when they're small. And those tend to be those fires that, that ignite under more benign or moderate fire weather conditions, mm -hmm. which in essence means that we're preferentially selecting for the worst of the worst, because those are the only ones that are uh, impacting our landscapes now because we make a choice to suppress the others. And we don't have a choice about whether we can suppress some of these given that they are, they are burning so intensely that they overwhelm our firefighting capacity and, and we essentially lose the battle at that stage. And then we experience these pretty significant fires. And, and those are what we see routinely in the news. Uh, and it really 
provide it really develops this sort of fear and, and concern rightfully of these fires um, but uh, limits our understanding of what we could do with fire to be more proactive and use fire um, particularly those that are, are burning under those more benign conditions and to use it to, to our benefit as, as we move into a future and, and develop this new relationship with fire which is really what the cohesive strategy is attempting to do so this is the dominant uh, strategy that's being employed across the United States, um, trying to align uh, community resilience and adaptation, our, uh, the benefits and resilience of our landscapes, and then also a safe and effective response. And so if we can intertwine these three dominant components that really um, alter the, the risk profile of our landscapes and communities, then we can try to, to move forward in a more um, adapted and uh, reduced risk environment into the future and but but key to this is that we have to learn to live with wildland fire that's ultimately what the cohesive strategy is attempting to do and to do that um, you know from the, the the wilderness down to the communities and we achieve that through by adapting homes and communities and here's an example of a fire burning adjacent to a beautiful cabin uh, in northern California and you can see because this cabin was uh, properly maintained and the landscape surrounding it was properly maintained that even with this uh, crown fire burning uh, fairly near to it the cabin survived successfully and so there are there is a need for communities to adapt and individual homeowners to adapt their structures to be more resilient to fire and this is one example of the, the successes of that and here's a here's another example this is a guard station on the Mount here National Forest and you can see that the Forest Service has done some, some thinning treatments and restoration treatments surrounding it. And here they had a wildfire that burned. A wildfire that was managed in part for resource objectives uh, and, and the structure was fine and, and safe in so doing. And so there's, you, you know, you can think of adapting communities from the home out in various ways to be more resilient to a future with, with more fire. Uh, we see lots of landscape restoration and this is some of uh, James's work on the Malheur National Forest and the restoration that they're doing uh, across that national forest through the Blue Mountains Forest Partnership. And you can see that they were able to, to remove some of the biomass here and, and, and get it at least closer to a semblance of the historical conditions uh, pre-Euro colonization of the West um, and as well provides a, a sustainable wood supply for uh, Malheur lumber out in John Day. Um, and then, as I noted, you know, there is this need to use more fire for resource objectives. As we think about living with fire, we can take those, some of those 98% successfully suppressed ignitions and leverage those for restoration of our landscapes as well as reducing the long term risk. And this is a case where this landscape to the left above this road system has burned. And this was in 2019 in the, in the 204 Cal Fire. So this, uh, the road formed a nice uh, boundary uh, containment line for this fire and then they were able to push it up into an old fire scar up on the top of the ridge. And you can see the effects that came from that. So they were able to make these decisions um, and, and now have reduced the risk and, and began the restoration process of restoring fire as, a, as, as an ecosystem process ultimately in this landscape. Now, a lot of that is really focused on the dry forest environment. Um, and we think about more fire and really getting fire back in as an ecological process, and all the thinning we do. As James noted, uh, Western Oregon is very different, particularly up here uh, adjacent to the Willamette Valley uh, where fire intervals are much longer. And what you see here is just an image from my backyard of the smoke that we endured here in Corvallis following the Labor Day firestorm uh, that most of us prob probably on this call have experienced. So we, we, we did see these, these large fires, and as James noted, they've happened before. These were not necessarily anomalous or climate-driven or past historically uh, management-driven. This was something that does occur in Western Oregon forests and did occur. We just don't see them very often, so they, they're referred to as these low probability, high consequence events. And that's what we experienced this year. Although we also experienced this all up and down the West Coast. 
And so what, if it wasn't necessarily a climate change driven effect, if it wasn't necessarily a historical management driven effect, how did these really set up? And I wanted to cover that a little bit just uh, uh, to maybe address some, some folks curiosity about these. And so here, here's what the year looked like from a drought perspective using the Palm, Palmer Drought Severity Index. And here we are in September and we can look all across time and say, you know, we weren't necessarily that anomalous from what occurs here as far as drought goes uh, in the month of September this year. But this isn't the full picture. I mean, we were very late season. Fires were occurring very late season. Um, and so the fields were dry, the forests were certainly dry. And from a, you know, a, a national perspective of wildland fire potential, we did see high potential across the West Coast, including uh, the Western Cascades up here. Um, and so, you know, you have to really, you know, take both of these pieces of evidence together and recognize that, you know, we weren't outside of the historical range of drought, but we were in a, in a pretty dry condition. Um, with regards to fire and the flammability of these fuels. Um, but that's just one side of it. So they're, they're prepped to some degree to be ready to burn like they did, um, but they're gonna need some kind of thrust to really get there. And that did set up on Labor Day, as uh, many of us know. And so I wanted to just show you how that sort of developed from a, a meteorological perspective. So what you see here on the left, you know, is uh, a, a typical, wind profile um, and you can see that in the gray is the jet stream right so this is a, the jet stream at the time on september 5th so a couple days preceding it and on the right is the same date looking at the, where the winds are pushing the smoke and all the red are these fires that were occurring and you can see that certainly california was heavily on fire uh oregon not so much with the exception of, of this this fire on the east, a couple of these little hot spots are just anomalies that, that, are detect, that, that show up in these satellite images. But I'm just going to walk you through several days of this to see how it, it ultimately unfolds and what happens on Labor Day. And, and in particular, pay attention to, to how the jet stream sort of begins to dip and change uh, and, and what that does to the smoke columns when you look at the right, right side image. So here's the sixth. And you can see this big dip now in that jet stream and it's really changing those high pressure systems and so when you get high pressure dry conditions over the great basin the interior regions it pushes wind from that high pressure to the low pressure system that sit off the coast those are general general wind courses that occur in, in meteorology all the time and in this case we had this real real um setup of a high pressure that started to push winds off to the east and in so doing it brings in that dry warm air from the interior out and so that further dries out uh, forest fuels and conditions and it, it results in a, a real substantial increase in wind speed and a change fundamentally in that wind direction and you can really see that now as this was setting up i received this text from a colleague in colorado so that jet stream really dipped right over colorado and they were on fire at that same time and here you can see they were receiving fire and snow. And it was just this, this wild dynamic that, that they experienced. And, and they did receive substantial amount of snow in the high country while everything else around the, the snow regions were on fire. And it was not enough to put out some of the major fires that continued to burn almost into December uh, along the front range outside of Fort Collins in there. So this was what happening far in the interior. And it was really happening from the Canadian border all the way down to the Mexican border this big front. And so we experienced uh, those, the, the east wind events here in Oregon, but so did California more broadly and up in the state of Washington. And there was a community that was lost in Spokane and so forth with this event. So it was a really major event that impacted the Western United States. And here's when that jet stream finally dipped over Colorado and was dumping snow on Colorado, we experienced those east wind events. And here you can see what that did. Um, so there was one fire that was burning, uh, the Beach Creek fire in the wilderness, but most of these ended up being human caused or ignited largely from power lines that resulted in lots of ignitions and under those windy dry conditions, they, they precipitated the large fires that we experienced here. And you can see how the smoke really played out all across the West Coast in this case with Oregon major fires being right up here along the Willamette Valley. And ultimately, 
that switched and we see the normal weather patterns set up. And that's why it was a really rapid sort of three day event before we were under that inversion and under the smoke that we experienced and the fires largely stopped with the exception of, of one fire that pushed back to the east, um, the lion's head fire, which I'll show in a little bit greater detail. But ultimately the fires just were snuffed out because of uh, the firefighting efforts as well as that inversion and the cooler temperatures that set in on them. Now, there was many things that occurred during that. Like I said, we, we saw this, this east wind event from the Canadian to the Mexican border, but here in Oregon, we, we, we saw fires um, occur in Southern Oregon. So the Almeda fire burned right through communities and all the way up to uh, the Riverside fire being our Northern fire that was sending spot fires into, into the rural landscape surrounding or within Clackamas County surrounding Portland region. But a um, couple interesting things happened is we, we really, you know, this Almeda fire, and this is my brother's home that was lost here that you see on the right. And this really was what I call a suburban fire. So we had it, it ignited in a park in Ashland and it moved right down a green belt, greenway, into the communities of Talent and Phoenix. And it really was rapid under those east wing conditions. Mm -hmm. Here we can see, you know, the ignition was at about 11 a.m. Uh, and, and I have it noted here in Ashland at one of their BMX parks. And by 3 p.m. that day, we saw it all the way into the community of Ashland. And there was really, this was just an evacuation that was moving so rapidly and so intensely that it was just about getting people out with firefighters doing what they can uh, to, to, to facilitate that while trying to find opportunities to contain this fire. And by that evening, it had moved into Phoenix and, uh, and, and lost, we, we lost major subdivisions all through town and, and Phoenix and so doing by that evening. And then it was largely over. That wasn't the only event. We also saw this other, what I call suburban wildfires that, that are sort of anomalous and new to our, to our thinking right now. And this, this is right, Lincoln City, Oregon, right? And so this wasn't a well-known fire because it, we, we were dealing with such a, a large number of larger fires, uh, but it ignited here also human cause and pushed right through communities with structures lost as well um, in just a rapid, rapid framework. But there were also these big ones, right? So as I noted, there's Beachy Creek was burning. And here you can see it, it really light, lit, ignited by lightning on August 16th. And this is what it looked like by August 26th, right? So it had grown all the way to 24 acres from a single tree ignition of lightning um, within that 10 day period. So it wasn't doing much, it was a really rugged, steep terrain. They were doing everything they could. I think there was 400 people ultimately on this fire. Uh, when it was still under 500 acres. So that's a huge firefighting force doing what they can, uh, but given the access and inability to get in there, it was, it was, a, it was a tough battle. Uh, meanwhile, the Lion's Head fire was burning here on the east side of Jefferson uh, on the Warm Springs Reservation, also ignited by lightning. Come the day before Labor Day, this is what we're looking at, 469 acres. So, you know, we're, we're three weeks into this fire, it's barely moving around, it's not doing much. The east side fires being different. These are the drier forest environments where the fuels are more combustible under just typical conditions. But come the next day, it looked like that, right? Or come in with a couple days, actually. This is how much it had, had uh, grown. From this little dot here at 469 acres prior to the wind event to this that we see here. Meanwhile, the riverside and other fires were occurring too. And you can see how this progressed the lion's head. And they ultimately merged and they merged right around Detroit and Detroit. Like, so the lions had actually impacted the community of Detroit. Uh, some ignitions that came out of the canyon here impacted all along Sandy M Canyon. And this uh, beachy looks like it primarily moved towards through the timberlands up in here. Didn't actually impact the communities like the ignitions that occurred down in the canyons did. Um, but ultimately, uh, pretty significant impacts. So you can see this is about the break right here where the lions had merged with the beachy creek right along here. And so it was really that lion's head from the dry forest, just as when I started this presentation, Hoxie had mentioned that the dry forest does transmit fire to the wet forest. Here's an example of that occurring in contemporary times. And because we are now occupying much of this landscape with our communities also impacting communities. And ultimately, you know, ultimately here you can see that we, we reached about this size of these two different fires. Uh, like I had said, the, the Beachy Creek fire itself pretty much stopped after three days, but the lines had continued to burn and actually made a, a pretty significant run. This piece up here, 
in the upper right corner was a significant run back to the east with the westerly shift. So once those winds shifted that we saw in those satellite images, we actually saw a pretty significant run on the lion's head back the other direction. Um, here they are, those three fires overlaid on some estimates of those fire regimes, the yellow being sort of a mixed moderate frequency and the blue being these very low frequency, high severity fire regimes. And, and they do intermix in this region. Um, but again, these are fires that are known to occur every, I don't know, between every 100 and 200 years. And we just happened to experience that this past year. Um, and you know, maybe these footprints won't experience those for another 100 or 200 years, but we may see some of those in the interspersions between those, those filling in those spaces. That probability has not changed. It's very unlikely, but the probability hasn't changed uh, nonetheless. And then, of course, there's the Holiday Farm Fire. If we looked a little bit farther south, um, I won't cover Archie Creek in this case. This was its spread. So it started um, here just outside of, uh, just east of Blue River. And it started on some private land and it burned down into this canyon um, uh, with pretty significant impacts to, to the, the communities residing along Highway 126. And this is the progression map. So you see this rapid blow up and then ultimately after a few days, it too reached that point where it, it, it subsided. And it burned through mixed ownership. So the purple here is some of the, uh, is warehouser land, I believe, but a lot of private timber lands here, a lot of communities interspersed along the canyon. So this is a, an ownership map. Um, I think, oh, just somewhere between 60 and 70% are is, is private lands burning within this landscape in this particular fire. And I was fortunate enough to be able to take a flight um, and work with the media a little bit. And this is really what that landscape is. So here's Blue River, Oregon, for those of you that know it. Um, up here in Rainbow is where that ignition occurred on the Holiday Farm RV park. And it ended up blowing down this canyon. And you can see this was early enough. You can see the black sticks really are a crown fire versus the red, which would be dead trees that were scorched from a different mechanism, which would be a surface fire. And, high intensity surface fire that still kills the trees. Whereas these are really that crown fire run where you would probably see 100 to 200 foot flames pushing up all across this under those east wind conditions. So what Blue, Blue River looked like uh, in the aftermath. Um, here's an example of a home that did have some, some defensible space and was protected by it despite these active crown fires. And I like this image from the airplane because if you can look at it, and we're looking west here, and this really is topographically funneled wind vector. And you can see the crown fires that just seem to skip across these ridges as it burns all the way down through this landscape. And it was really bound by these, uh, these, these two ridges that run through here uh, pretty significantly as it made a large run down through that landscape. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. This is just an example of a Slater fire that was burning under this on the California Oregon border. And the point of this is here's a 2017 and 2018 fires that are adjacent to it. And those really corralled even these large, very intense fires. This is why we often see fire as a solution to these fire challenges is because they can have a substantial effect on fire spread and containment. Um, but once it made it to the north of that, it made its push to the west, uh, like all the other fires. And I apologize for that sound. I'm getting door replaced downstairs and they just showed up. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop and we'll take questions. James, Chris, thanks, thanks very much. We've got a few questions in the uh, chat and people can certainly uh, type some more in there as we go. I'm gonna take the liberty of paraphrasing a little bit and uh, have some conversation around those. Uh, you, you guys had all mentioned that, uh, that fire is just something that we've always had in the forest. Uh, some of that naturally caused, some of it human caused. Uh, Pre-European times, uh, it looks like that, uh, that Native Americans were oftentimes intentionally starting fires or using fire as a, as a management tool towards various ends. Uh, what what can we or have we learned from the way that uh, the indigenous peoples use fires to manage a landscape? And are there some partnerships ongoing that, that tap into that indigenous knowledge for our, our broader management plans? 
James, I'd love to have you start on that with your, your Rigdon work and what you're thinking about seeing there. Uh, no, I'd love to have you. Take <laughs> All right. Well, James does have some some really interesting stories to tell, and I hope that he will. Um, I know it's uh, it's new and ongoing science right now, so there's a lot to be learned there. Um, you know, the Native Americans were managing the landscapes extensively. They they were here, you know, certainly on the West Coast, you know, from fourteen thousand years ago on, and they managed the landscapes to their benefit. Uh, just like we have done, but in a different fashion, and, and they have a different culture and different relationship with nature uh, and fire in particular. And they'd use fire for, uh, you know, food production, depending on where they're at, for shifting grazing patterns of uh, some of their hunting prey. They would use fire for protection of their own communities, clearing of trails for their travel routes, um, prepping acorns for harvest, uh, warfare at times. And so it was an extensively used tool by Native Americans, a lot of that being in a prescribed fire sense, like we would say today, uh, particularly around the valleys and around the dry forest environment. And that, of course, was, you know, early colonizers, as, as Europeans arrived to the West, they adopted many of those strategies. The miners did, a lot of the grazing um, uh, folks did as well. And, and that, that, uh, sort of management regime was carried forward for a little bit until uh, we saw that transition that largely followed the 1910 big burns that occurred all across the Western US, but centered in Idaho and Montana. Did I answer your question effectively? As far as partnerships going, yes, there are always ongoing partnerships. I have some work in uh, just over the Southern border in, in Northern California, working with the group tribes. Um, to look at indigenous burning patterns and how that modified vegetation landscapes and how that augmented the natural ignitions, the lightning ignitions that are so prevalent in that landscape and what that means for our ability to restore the forest moving forward. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna use that answer to segue, jump down a little bit to, to the question from Andy and expand on it a little bit. Uh, Fire and, and controlled burns uh, can be or could be one way to reduce uh, potential catastrophic wildfire risks in east side or, or maybe even west side of forest. Uh, management uh, is also being bannered about as a way to manage fire risk, whether it be thinning, as, as Andy describes in, uh, in his question, which I think you can see in front of you. Um, or I, I've also heard it say that uh, on West Side Force, larger clear cuts in some ways can, can mimic what a fire might have done um, and as a, uh, as a rationale for, for larger uh, openings occurring in force. What, what is the sense from the two of you to which uh, management can be either used to, to mimic fire, uh, and is that appropriate? or can management be used to reduce the risk and intensity of fires when they do occur? Well, Ryan, that was a pretty long question. <laughs> and you're, you're welcome to put a finer point on it if you want. I'll just say this, is that managing for fire is partly a question of managing forests but it's even more importantly a question of managing people. Many of these fires are started by people or started by human infrastructure like power lines. And many of the worst effects of fire are to human communities. And so I think that our challenge is to some degree less new forest management than it is new people management. Building safer communities, having safer, more effective response, um, better preparedness, better public safety, um, better adaptation of rural communities, uh, addressing crime, addressing homelessness, addressing rural poverty would go a long way to creating more fire resilient human communities. <laughs> 
Fundamentally, I think that what we have to get our arms around is a people management question. Chris, what do you have to add? Uh, I have to add my agreement with James that that is very true. And that is particularly pertinent on the West side where, you know, forced restoration, like we see in the dry forest environments would, would be fundamentally different and not necessarily uh, in the same fashion where you see a risk reduction like we do on the East side. And so it really is about the, the managing the communities and the people to make them more resilient and prepared in the wake of, of this potential that we experienced this year. Um, you know, I, I remember back when I first met James and his, his master's thesis was on this exact question about these large clear cuts um, mimicking fire dynamics. And so I'm not gonna let him get away with not answering that because he did an entire thesis on this matter. Uh, but that that is, uh, that I think that is the conclusion you drew too, right, James? Is that you know if you're if you're talking about these large standard placing fires as the normal or characteristic fire regime, then if you were managing within that context, then you would you would look at larger patches of management less frequently, and that is in contrast to a, a dry side forest where you would see much smaller or individual tree type work more often. I see that we've got lots of other questions. Um, let's move on to that. I would just say that in terms of forest management, it's all about objectives. What do you, what do you want to, what are the outcomes you desire? I'll let you ask another question, Ryan. Okay. Um, well, I'm just, just a little follow up on that one. Cause I, I'm starting to get a, a, a sense from you that, you know, if, if we could sort of suppress and, and, uh, you know, avoid fires, that, that would be great. And maybe I didn't expect that. So maybe I'm misunderstanding. Let me, let me ask the, the question. If, if we had a magic wand and this, this IA, which I think stands for initial attack, uh, you know, if we could have a hundred percent success rate there and not have wildfires, is that a success, truly a success or do wildfires play a role and, and we do, we actually need them? It is the case that wildfires play a role and we do need them, but even more than that, wildfire is completely and totally inevitable. We will never ever be able to exclude wildfire from Western landscapes or from Oregon. And the reason is because of all the oxygen in the atmosphere. We, we live on a fiery planet um, because there's oxygen. We all, it's also all about our location, as I mentioned in my opening. We get a lot of rain in the winter, um, but it's real hot and dry in the summer. It's very poor conditions for decomposition, but it's ideal conditions for fire. We'd be taken over by biomass if it weren't for fire. Fire is in large part what keeps biomass in check in our part of the world. So we will always have fire we will never be able to suppress all fires. It simply can't be done. Okay. And I think that was it. I think that was evident even in that, that graph I showed you of initial attack success rate that our, our uh, fire management organizations have, have shown. Even back in the fifties the when, when it was easier to respond to fires because of the climatic conditions and the forests hadn't, hadn't densified and the fields hadn't accumulated by then. They still were not 100% successful. Our current, um, they never were, and they are not now, and won't be. Our current fire suppression management policies don't suppress fires. What they're doing is selecting for severe fires. We put out fires that burn under moderate weather conditions, moderate fuel conditions. We can't put out those fires that are burning under extreme weather conditions. And so really what fire suppression is, is it's not fire suppression, it's fire selection. We're selecting for those fires that can have pretty significant consequences to human communities. Yeah, I guess there's two considerations. One is, is there a good fire in this instance that somehow the forest benefits from it? 
that you want to encourage? And then is there what you might call a bad fire and that the, the risk to communities and to lives is, is slightly more intense and that one perhaps deserves a little more uh, attention. Okay, this, so then- uh, This is a, sort of a joke among fire ecologists. The question is, is fire good or bad? And the answer is yes. <laughs> So it's good, they're going to happen. Uh, uh, kind of moving down to Emily's question at the bottom there. Uh, what, what then af after the fire? And you, we can even look at some of the specific examples of this, this summer's fires and what we've learned from the, uh, the fire that burned in the gorge and other places. Um, talk about post-fire resilience a little bit. Uh, do we, uh, if, if they are natural, do we allow the, the forest to naturally regenerate as they will? Um, and, to, and to Emily's question, I, how have plants adapted to survive those fires? Uh, or are there post-fire management activities that we can do to A, either aid the recovery process, or B, say, shoot, these trees have burned, we might as well get some of the fiber out of there. Um, and what are the considerations around those choices? I'm failing this class. I don't even understand the question. <laughs> what do you do after the fire? <laughs> Did you let it take care of itself? Or do you get in there and uh, is, is there something to be done to, uh, to help the forest recovery process along? It depends on your management objectives. I think, yeah, I think that always is the underlying basis, right, is, is what your managing objectives. Certainly on the private timberlands, they're going to go in salvage recoup that material and then begin the next generation for us right so it's time time matters significantly in that now the west side fires you know they're going to recover there's going to be this flush of vegetation response probably a flush of biodiversity uh that that thrives off of that vegetation response um and that utilizes a lot of the deadwood and that sort of material and so you, you do see this very dynamic post-fire environment and that that's, you know, the, the type of environment you incur is gonna depend on the severity of that fire that came through. Sometimes it's high severity, standard placing, you get that really diverse early sterile response out of it. And sometimes it's gonna be in the moderate or the low severity where um, there's a decrease in the effects of the fire and a change to the, that forest system. And so the, there's gonna be some diversity across that, but that's sort of a, a the, the west side perspective, like, it, you know, these forests are really productive. They're very successful at regenerating. Um, I, I had some sample plots and some fires on the west side from back in um, you know, 2002 that had upwards of 100,000 trees per acre regenerating. It's really dense, you know, not anything that's moving towards you know, production of good fiber for uh, timber management, but certainly uh, huge mass abundance of of regenerating trees very skinny skinny and tall and so those you know they're, they're going to recover fine on the west side there are some challenges on the east side or in southwestern oregon where um it, it's starting to look like there may be a, a lack of regeneration and recovery of the forest um and then what people are referring to as a uh you know a, a vegetation state change to either shrub communities or it's going to take you know hundreds of years for recovery largely because of the post-fire climatic conditions that we experience today and so in those cases there, there there may be a need to to reforest if we're going to try to maintain a forest on those sites back to the objectives whether that's a futile effort given the changing climate uh, remains to be seen um, but certainly it, it can be pursued and if if uh, recuperation of the the fiber through salvage logging is, is necessary along that path, um, then that would be an, a viable option to pursue. Okay. Any, any other uh, final thoughts or questions? I might have, I'm just scrolling back through to see uh, what I've missed here from folks as I was jumping around. Uh, there, there's a question about do the uh, do these fires move along move or grow in historic patterns right what, what you've seen uh, can we I guess can we predict the way a fire is going to behave and spread based on what it's done in the past or 
or the conditions unique each time, I guess. Yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of fire behavior models out there. Um, they typically have to be highly modified by an expert analyst, even for fire suppression efforts to get them to really mimic what that fire is doing. Um, and so they're not very predictive about where the final fire perimeter is going to be in that sense, but through work with the incident management teams, they can make them better. Um, so there's that case. Now we all also do some analytics where we use past fire perimeters to see what features fire managers are capable of using to suppress these large fires. And we can look at the, those features all across landscapes and predict out as to what would be good control locations, and viable options in the future. But then you have to have uh, a fire that occurs and it occurs far enough from these control locations and the conditions where firefighters can actually do the work that they do uh, to, to contain those fires. So uh, in short, no fires, we don't have the models that are just gonna predict when you have ignition where it's gonna go uh, real specifically, but we do okay. And we do okay by, by being in, involved in and watching the progression over time and adjusting our models in situ. Okay. Uh, last minute or two, I guess I just give uh, Chris, you and you and James. Are there any final parting thoughts, bits of wisdom, uh, closing uh, remarks you'd want to make? I really appreciate what Sustainable Northwest Woods are doing. Is doing. Um, you know, there's a lot that we can be doing to help create more fire adapted, more resilient communities. And a lot of that does have to do with consumer choices in wood products. Um, so for those of you not familiar with the work that Ryan and Lynn are doing, um, you know, please visit their webpage and, uh, and do some shopping. <laughs> Thanks very much for, for having us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, James. Chris? Likewise, and, and, you know, uh, I can certainly echo those sentiments. And then I'll, I'll just say, you know, it's going to take all of us to really adapt to this fire reality. Um, building materials are a big part of that, um, as well as just understanding that we're going to have to use more fire at times. So we're going to have to tolerate smoke and be prepared for those kind of uh, conditions to occur. The Rogue Basin down in southwestern Oregon deals with it almost on an annual basis. So they're getting more adapted and, and, and used to those conditions, um, as impactful as they are to, to their economic base and their, their livelihoods. Um, and so it, it's really gonna take an adaptation of our ecosystems, of us as people, and of our fire management organizations to, to move us into this new future um, that doesn't just select for the worst, but promotes the best. Um, and it doesn't matter where you live, if you're in the heart of the city or you're in a rural community, it's, it, we're, we all have stake in this game and it's important that we come together to, to find a good solution. Okay, well, thank you guys for joining us today and maybe even more importantly, thank you for uh, the important work you do in, uh, in your respective fields on this front. Uh, this has been recorded, so it'll be up on our website here before too long for anybody who wants to go back and, and see a recap. And, uh, if there's questions that uh, we didn't get to, which I'm sure there are a couple, uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and volunteer. Reach out to Chris and James. Uh, ask them that question. They'll do, do, do the best answer for you. Thank you both so much. Really great talk today. Really appreciate your, your wisdom and experience and, and humor. And um, yeah, appreciate the stories. Thank you.